Yes, we are live, not memory. All right, we will go ahead and uh, get started this morning. Thank you all for being here, and also for those of you who are watching online, I forgot to say that last week, because we went a couple of weeks here without streaming, so I just forgot about it last week. But we're glad to have everyone with us present in person and online as well. And uh, believe it or not, we've only got one more class, so uh, we're winding down here, and I think we might make it. We've only got three chapters for next week, so unless we get terribly far behind this morning, we should be okay. You may have to bear with me a little bit. I'm struggling with my good eye, so I may be going back and forth between bifocals and readers and magnifiers. <laughs> i got all kinds of stuff up here, but <laughs> trying to see what we're talking about. So anyhow, uh, this is where we are. Uh, we're going to try to do 43 through 47 today. It's a big chunk of text, but most of it you're probably pretty familiar with. And then next week it'll be 48, 49, and 50. So if you're reading ahead, you only have three chapters to, to finish up the book for next week. So let's go ahead and get started here. 43 through 47. I can't see what this says. It says, from Owen Jones, the history of Joseph and his brethren. So, just a little art there to kind of show what these chapters are about. So, let's start in 43. Um, 43 is where uh, Joseph's brothers uh, return back to Egypt. Uh, we are told uh, there in verse 2 that there is a famine in Canaan. These famines were not that uncommon. They happen quite a bit. And uh, uh, as you know, probably in the in the uh, Egypt, the Nile would normally overflow its banks, and that's what made that land so fertile. But sometimes it didn't. And when it didn't, they couldn't grow anything. The same thing happened in Mesopotamia with the Tigris and the Euphrates. And Canaan, uh, which is now Israel, there's really not a lot of water in that country. If you go up north to Dan, there's a pretty big river up there that runs over to the Jordan, but there's really not a lot of water to be had, and they would always build like cisterns and things and try to catch uh, either the snow that was melting off of Mount Hermon or other rain that came down and try to store it uh, for a time when they would be dry and need water. So uh, famine was not that unusual, uh, and when it happened, it could be pretty bad, and people would die from not having enough water and food. Um, and so that's what's going on here uh, in verse 2. Um, this is chapter 43. Uh, when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, this is Jacob, go again, buy us a little food. So they've already gotten, you know, they've been down there once and gotten some supplies and come back. Now they've exhausted those supplies. And so he's saying, let's go back and get some more because we're out. We need some more food. And he gets a little bit of pushback from Judah in, uh, in verse 2, because Judah says, um, if you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food, but if you will not send them, we will not go down, for the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. So Joseph, you know, is really wanting to see Benjamin and kind of made that a contingency upon them coming back and getting more food. And of course, Jacob having already lost Joseph in his mind, um, is not wanting to lose the other son of Rachel, and he's very protective of Benjamin. And that's what you can imagine. And so he's not wanting to turn loose of him and let him go. That phrase there, you shall not see my face, basically means it's a euphemism for saying, you can't come into my presence without Benjamin with you. So don't bother coming back if you're not bringing Benjamin, because he wants to see Benjamin. And of course, Jacob doesn't want to turn loose of him. Um, so Judah kind of goes into an elaborate argument here about, you know, we've been down there, it's just what he told us, we're going to have to have him. 
And finally, Judah more or less uh, pledges his safety. This is in verse 9. Um, it says, I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have returned twice. <laughs> I love that. It's like, you could have been there twice and back by now, you know, while we're talking about it. <laughs> Sounds like something we would say today, right? <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that he uh, uh, is willing to pledge himself. You know, Reuben earlier had said something about, I'll kill my two kids if, you know, if it, something happens to him. But, but Judah doesn't go quite that far, but he does say that he will make it good, that he will pledge his safety for him, and he will offer to stay behind as a slave or whatever is necessary to make sure that, uh, that Benjamin is safe. So, um, let's see, in verse 12, uh, they take back twice the money. You'll recall the last time they got back and they opened their sacks and said, whoa, where's all this money come from? You know, all that, the steward, I guess, of Joseph had put additional money into their sacks. And uh, they were like, oh no, now we're in trouble. So now they're going to take back twice as much as what had been given to them so they can make recompense. And, you know, so we didn't have anything to do with it. Um, verse 11 is kind of interesting. We go back one verse here. Uh, their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. So he's kind of got a little gift package for him too, of some of the produce of the land uh, that they did have. And um, the, the word that's there, when it says the best yield of the land, um, there's a word used there called zimrat, which basically means strength or power. But it's also very close to another word, zamora, uh, which means branch or root. So both of these, um, it's really the first word that's in the text. But uh, as you can see, both of these are kind of conferring the idea that the land has power, that there's the fruitfulness of the land, and these this gum and the honey and all this stuff represents the produce of the land that they have that they're taking back to them. And I think there's also a reference to this. I put a little arrow here, 3725. Go back and look at that because I don't remember what 3725 said. Then they sat down to eat and looking at, oh, oh, this is the Ishmaelites. They're coming from Gilead. Uh, and the Ishmaelites were carrying gum, balm, and myrrh on their way down to Egypt. So likely that's where some of this stuff may have come from, the trading uh, with the Ishmaelite people as they came through on their way down to Egypt. So they get down there, and in verse 16, uh, see, yeah, Joseph invites them out to lunch. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought them into Joseph's house. So they're going to have lunch together in Egypt in Joseph, i.e. Pharaoh's, kind of acting as a pharaoh, his house. Um, and it's at this point, a little bit later, that Joseph asks about his father in verse 27. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? Now, you can imagine, a lot of time's gone by. It's been about 22 years since Joseph was put in the pit and the Ishmaelites or whomever picked him up and took him down to Egypt. So he hasn't seen his daddy in at least 22 years. And he has no idea if he's still alive or not. Well, he was old then, so, you know, so he has no idea if he's alive or not alive, but he's really interested in trying to find out from them uh, what is the status of Jacob's health uh, and is he well. Verse 30. Joseph um, hurried out. This is where uh, he starts crying. Joseph hurried out for his compassion, grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there, and he washed his face. So this is the first weeping. We're going to see two more weeping episodes this morning. This is a very emotional 
text in terms of Joseph and what's happened to him from his brothers uh, and then being reunited not only with them but with his own blood brother. Benjamin is the only one who's a blood brother. The rest of them are half brothers. And then uh, in verse 34, they all get gifts, but guess what? Benjamin gets a lot more. <laughs> he gets five times as much. It's kind of interesting that, you know, you think that Joseph might learn his lesson about favoritism, you know, because the whole reason he went up a bit was because Joseph showed favoritism toward him, made him the fancy coat and made the brothers jealous, and now he's showing favoritism toward Benjamin. So Joseph did learn lessons very well. But he also was married with him. What's that? It says that they were married with him. Married with him. Mm -hmm. we wanted yeah, that basically means they got a little drunk. <laughs> <laughs> they had some wine and got a little drunk. But they still uh, don't know that Joseph is their brother. Not yet, not but yet. that's coming. <laughs> that is coming. So this is kind of a, an interesting reunion here. Let's see if I missed anything in here. Oh, yeah, verse 32 is kind of an interesting insight, too. Um, Verse 32 says, they served him by himself, Joseph, by himself, and then by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination for the Egyptians. So the Egyptians culturally didn't really care for the Hebrews. In fact, we're going to get into this in the next chapter, I think, or the one after it, about don't tell them you're shepherds, because they didn't like people who were shepherds. And so shepherds, you know, obviously eat a lot of lamb, right? And that was one of the reasons that they wouldn't eat with them because Hebrews ate a lot of lamb. And of course, lamb is sheep, right? So, so they didn't, uh, they just didn't have a cultural affinity for the Jewish people at all and didn't want to be around them. So it's kind of weird. You think somebody invites you to their house, you know, for lunch, and so I'm going to sit down here and y'all sit down there. <laughs> we'll, we'll have dinner together, right? It's kind of weird, but that's that's the way they did it culturally because of this. Uh, it's it's kind of odd, too. It's, it's they very odd. They knew Joseph was Hebrew, mm -hmm. but still, he was a well, second in command. Yeah, I don't know that the brothers knew that he was Hebrew at this point. He makes a pretty good job of passing himself off. Now, I don't know Egyptian. where the brothers, the, the Egyptians. Yeah, the Egyptians, yeah. Egyptian knew he was Hebrew. Yeah, they knew, correct. Yeah. yeah. It is interesting. It? It's just kind of weird. It's also interesting that he's sent the brothers in verbal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good point there. <laughs> okay, any other questions about chapter 43 before we move on? Here. It's amazing how they he seated them by their age. Yeah, yeah, that's what now is bringing out. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I can down here, Tommy. Yeah, and uh, yeah, how does he know how they are? Yeah, right? yeah. how does he know their age? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Just a lucky guess, I guess. <laughs> okay, so in forty-four, uh, this is where Joseph tests his brothers, and uh, let's see, forty-four two. I'll just start at the top of the chapter. He commanded the steward of the house, fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of the sack, and then two, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. So Joseph is kind of setting up a little, I mean, Joseph, uh, yeah, Joseph is setting up a little trap here uh, for them, uh, just as before, when the steward put the money back in the bags and they said, oh, look, that's, that's an extra money. Well, now he's putting not only money, but also the silver cup that belongs to Joseph that would be easily recognizable as being Joseph's cup and putting it in Benjamin's sack so that he's going to be the one uh, that looks like took the cup. It's a real setup. In verse 4, he continues on, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys they had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you pay, repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and that by this he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. So he sends his buddies after them and basically captures uh, Benjamin uh, because he has the cup in his sack. And in fact, I think we didn't read quite far enough there, but uh, 
they say whoever whoever has it should be killed, <laughs> and uh, that yeah, obviously that's not what they want to be at with Benjamin. Um, and then in thirteen they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. So this is basically just a ploy on the part of Joseph in order to be able to hold over Benjamin and to get him to stay there. Um, yeah, whichever one, that's verse 9, whichever one of your servants is found with it shall die, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And then Judah says, please let your servant remain instead of the boy, in verse 33. So, at 17, also, um, He said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. So again, this is part of Judah's um, presentation here. Um, and he's saying basically, um, he, sh he shall um, become my slave. Kind of like Joseph having become a slave to the Egyptians when his brother sold him earlier. So it's kind of the times are reversed here uh, in that way. And in verse 22, there's two terms used there, the lad versus the man. In 22, he's called the lad. In, 20, in 17, he's called the man, referring to Joseph. But Joseph is probably about in his 20s here at this point, maybe 30s. Um, so he's like a young, he's not like a little boy. Yeah, 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 Benjamin, I'm sorry, is it Benjamin? Yeah, that is 22, right? Okay. All right, so did we get everything on this one? I think so. Any questions about 43? 43. I, I had a thought about the male and Judah kept up. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, Beth in here, she brought this up last week, that Judah, you know, despite his earlier problems, and then we saw last week his thing with Tamar, uh, he does kind of come around and step up at this point in the story and is really kind of accepting responsibility uh, for the brothers, more or less, even though he was involved uh, early on. So you do kind of see a little bit of a change in Judah over time, which I think is one of the reasons why he winds up being the one that the lineage comes, all the kings and ultimately Jesus come down through Judah rather than through any of the other firstborn sons like Reuben or Simeon or Levi. So it kind of explains that a little bit. I just wonder if that experience with Tamar was not really what changed his life. Yeah, it, it had to have had an impact on him. You remember the big, the great line from last week was that. She is more righteous yeah. than me. Yeah. I mean, he realized it uh, when she presented the things to him. So I think you're right. I think that probably really kind of <laughs> shook him to his senses a little bit, maybe. Okay, we'll move on to 45. Oops, we got a picture here. What is this? This is, uh, well, this is supposed to be them finding the cups of Benjamin Sachs. <laughs> he wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> 45, uh, Joseph provides for his brothers and their family. So this is when they do finally come back with Jacob now. Um, interesting that in, in the very first verse here, uh, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out so no one stayed with him uh, when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. So this is the second time he's crying. But now he's really crying. I mean, everybody is hearing he's crying so loud. This is probably a pretty big place. You, know, you can imagine like a temple complex kind of thing. So it's so the governmental headquarters, if you will. So um, he's crying so much that even the Egyptians outside are hearing uh, crying uh, over being reunited with his brothers. Um, obviously, the brothers were not real happy to hear that this is Joseph. <laughs> They're probably going, oh boy, now we're in. <laughs> what's he going to do to us now? <laughs> we know what we did to him. <laughs> what's he going to do to us, right? <laughs> they were just a little bit dismayed. <laughs> um, 
But Joseph's take on it is really good. Let's look at verse 5. I love this. Um, he puts him at ease. Um, back up to verse 4. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. So he really, got, Joseph really has a God perspective on this whole thing. Even though he's been in prison, even though he's been mistreated, and all of this, he's got a real perspective of that this was God's plan. And, it, and yeah, you saw me say, but you didn't really know what you were doing. This was God working through all this in order that I could save your lives and a whole lot of other people's lives too. So it's really interesting that he can have uh, that perspective despite everything he's been through. There's no hint of vengeance or now I'm going to get you because I'm the ruler and you're not. And, you know, none of that. Not the normal human things that you might think of. He doesn't come across like that at all. He sees it as part of God's will. And I think it really brings up a, a question for us of, you know, how do we see God's providence? And when things are going on that don't look good, can we see God working in those things? And I was thinking to myself as I was reading through this, and thinking, you know, what's going on in Ukraine? I mean, that was awful, right? <laughs> and here's a country invading, killing people, bombing cities. But can we see God's providence in that in any way? It's hard. It's hard. But Joseph had pretty bad issues too, and yet he was able to see that God was working through that. And so I think it's a challenge for us maybe to look at things in a little bit different light and try to see how God might be working. We're told that you know all the governing authorities are put in power because God put them there. I guess that would include Vladimir Putin. Uh, <laughs> even though most of us probably don't like what he's doing right now. But uh, you know, how is God working through that process and what would be the outcome of that process? Any thoughts, ideas? I know that only it's a little heavy to think about. <laughs> Joseph certainly could see it uh, in what had happened to him, which is really amazing. It was not you who sent me here, but God. This is in verse 8. And then in verse 13, he wants to see his daddy. Um, oh wait, I'm going to all the way back to the wrong chapter here. Joseph at that point does have a lot of years to reflect on that. Oh okay. yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. He's been quite a time in prison. Like, <laughs> he can look back and see that. Yeah. But we don't know how long he was in prison before the, um, the dreams, but we know he was there at least two years after the dreams before he got brought out to, to do Pharaoh's room. So you're right. He had a lot of time to reflect on and to see what was going on. A couple of weeks ago, you mentioned that he was in Pharaoh's prison mm -hmm. rather than the, the typical or, or, or the, the yeah. common man's Just prison. Just a political prison. More yes. Or so I, I wonder what his life was like in that prison. Yeah. It probably wasn't quite as bad as like the one with the rapists and the murderers and all yeah. those people. But, uh, but it was still, he wasn't free, so... He, didn't, he couldn't go back and do what he wanted to, so I don't get the sense that he was vastly mistreated. But, but, but even then, God looked at him because before long, the prison warden put him in charge. Mm -hmm. So he had to. Yeah, it's kind of like they could recognize that God was with him and that things that he did prospered. And so they would put him into these yeah. positions of authority. It's really kind of cool the way that worked out. Yeah, even, even the Egyptians who didn't necessarily believe in God could see that, well, his God's with him, and he kind of does good stuff. So, I don't know anything about our current prison system from the inside, mm -hmm. but, you know, watching movies, you, no. you've always <laughs> you've always got, what do they call them, the trustees? Yeah. You know, uh, so I kind of think of Joseph as a trustee yeah. where, you know, he's, he's elevated amongst the, the, the rest of the group. He probably helped him, the wardens or whomever. Yeah, and, and I would think that I would think that that would help him see God's plan yeah. in action. You know, for us, it's it's you, you asked about the Ukraine and, and Russia, and I'm thinking I struggle to see anything good coming from that. It may be ten years from now when we look yeah. back and say, "Ah," yeah. but in the, when we're in the heat of battle, and, and it's hard to see. certainly there's several 
that are dealing in the heat of battle in this congregation right now, and it's hard to see what's what the good's going to be. Yeah. And I think that's really a challenge for us is to try to find it, even though it's hard sometimes. And we probably, you're right, we probably won't a lot of times until we're much further down the road. And say hindsight is 2020, but that's very true because a lot of times we don't really understand things until we're a lot further down from uh, where we are immediately. <laughs> Okay, so where were we here? It's not in the sent now. Verse 13, that's what I was looking for. Are we still recording? No, we're going to make 36. Okay. Right, this is Then he fell down on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck, and he kissed all the brothers that wept on them, and after that his brothers talked with him. And then I thought this was where he had said that he wanted to see Jacob. Did I get that wrong? Verse 9. Verse 9. Yeah, thank you. Hurry up and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You shall go on the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. Now, one thing I thought about, what do you think the brothers told him the truth? <laughs> They've got to go back and tell Jacob, oh, by the way, Joseph's still alive. <laughs> I know we gave you that bloody coat, <laughs> but <laughs> do you think they messed up? Or did they just say, you know, he must have got away from that animal. He's down in Egypt now. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> I have a hard time well, seeing them confessing. To, they would have to brothers would have to admit what they really did. No, they wouldn't have to. I mean, yes, yeah. Well, how, how did all this happen otherwise? Yeah. They'd have to be pretty honest with them. And if not, they knew that Joseph would tell their father. He might. I'm sure he, he would. Yeah, he, he no, certainly he could. <laughs> he certainly could have. But I just, I've got to thinking about that. I was, I'm not so sure they told him. I think they said he got away from that wild animal. <laughs> you know, he's in Egypt. Imagine that. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, it's interesting to think about. It, isn't it? <laughs> um, Pharaoh says they'll give him the best of the land. This is in verse 18. Um, this is where I need to magnify it here. So being um, Yeah, that one is eight. We've got another note on here. It's from verse eight. Being a father to Pharaoh, it's supposed to be like an authority figure. Yes. He, yeah, it says, He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So this is when uh, uh, he's explaining, Joseph is explaining why God did this and that. <laughs> That phrase there, he's made him a father of Pharaoh, basically means that he's given him all of the authority. He's functioning basically as Pharaoh um, because he has all of the authority of Pharaoh. And of course, in verse 10, you shall dwell in the land of Goshen, you shall be near me. Um, Goshen, we'll look at this in a few minutes on a, on a slide, but it's basically the northeastern corner of Egypt. So if you think about Egypt, it's kind of that square country in the upper right hand of Africa. This is the, the right hand corner of that. It's very close to the Nile, which is why it was such a productive land, because the Nile would overflow and wet the fields, and they would have lots of good crops and things because of that. So a lot of times, yeah, in my mind, I always think, when I think about Egypt, I think about you know desert, and dry, and not very productive. But that part of Egypt is very, very productive. And it's one of the more productive regions agriculturally in the world. So, and you can get Giza bed sheets from there. <laughs> 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 Did I have heard that? <laughs> Do um, they come on Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think you have to talk to Mike Lindell about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then Joseph, of course, says uh, in verse 28, I will go see him before I die. It is enough. My son is still alive. I will go see him before I die. Jacob's pretty old here. but he, He's about 130, I believe. Um, but he winds up living there 17 years because he dies at 147. So 
he's going to have a good bit of time with Joseph, even after the 22 years that have gone by that he's been without him. So it's it's kind of a nice outcome for um, for Jacob in this. pictures here. I'm not sure I can read what this is. Joseph is recognized by his brothers. This artist's rendition. <coughs> and this is another one from that set of uh, uh, the history of Joseph and his brothers that we saw earlier. And then this is a black and white of um, Jacob leaving. Uh, they're kind of getting all the good stuff. <laughs> I just had to laugh and I thought about you know Jacob and all of his people there and all of his herds and everything getting ready to leave and, and to go to Egypt, it's just a crazy idea popped in my head. I thought about the Beverly Hillbillies loading the car and hitting, <laughs> hitting the Beverly Hills. You know? <laughs> That's supposed to be what it looked like. You know? We're going to get all our stuff and take it to Egypt, right? <laughs> so I don't know if it was really like that or not. <laughs> they had a lot of people and a lot of stuff. So <laughs> it was a big deal to probably organize that trip. <laughs> okay, 46. Any questions on 45? We move on. Check the time here. 11 okay, good. 10 more minutes. I think we can make it here. Okay, 46. Joseph brings his family to Egypt. Uh, let's read the first part here. I love this part where he stops in Beersheba and um, has this little interaction with God. Um, so 46 1. So Israel took his journey with all that he had. And came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am the God, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So this is yet another theophany, and this one's kind of couched in the term of night vision, so I don't know if that means dream or not dream, but you know, God is clearly communicating with uh, um, Jacob in this uh, as he's on his way down to Egypt, and basically carrying forward the promise, I'm going to be with you even down there, and I'm going to bring you back, because that's not his home, and he wants to come back at, at some point. So uh, I, just, I think that's a really cool section there where we see again God telling him, I'm the God of your father. You know, here he mentions Isaac, but obviously Jake, uh, Abraham as well. And he sacrifices there too. Reggie. Yes. How would you describe it, uh, a dream from a vision? How would I describe yeah. the difference you mean? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, they're kind of hard, I think, necessarily. So they would just be maybe a, a, just a, just a, you just have a short dream, just of a vision of this person, or uh, that could be, uh, I don't know. Now, there may be some overlap between them. I, I'm not really 100% sure, Charlie. That's a good question. Um, I mean, we all know what dreams are, right? We, we recognize dreams, but visions. Anybody here had a vision lately? <laughs> I haven't had any visions. So. Visions, I think, are harder for us to kind of get like our we, heads around. Would that would be something like we call a ghost today, you know, when I'm talking to a vision. So I, don't, so I don't know, when it says he had night visions, was he awake or was he asleep? I guess that's the trick. Uh, if he's asleep, maybe it's a dream. If he's awake and he saw it, you know, it's kind of like the Christmas carol, you know, Christmas past and present future. Uh, those were more, he was awake, right, during those times. So, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think there may be a little bit of overlap between the two. Not really don't you think it would have something to do with the content? Um, it could, I mean, yeah. if, if you're having a dream, it's just random things. Uh -huh. But if it's a vision, I would think it would be in the same format, but very specific. Yeah. Well, vision is clearly direction from God. Right. He's, he's telling him, you're going down there. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bring you back. Some very specific things. Um, and that had happened before with, uh, with Isaac and with Abraham to some extent, too. So I, I don't want to go out on a limb when I say this, but... The, have you ever solved a problem in your sleep? Not that I can recall. I mean, I, often I, I'll wake up at, you know, two or three, four o'clock in the morning, and my brain has gone to work on me, <laughs> and I'm still trying to sleep. Yeah. But the next thing I know, 
<laughs> I've solved the problem that I know I'm going to face the next day. Well, Something go. left over from yesterday that I'm yeah. going to face again. So, you know, That's I just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's just me trying to think what's a vision like. Well, maybe yeah. problem solving in your sleep. Maybe so. Yeah. The other Paul thing. had a vision of the night in uh, Acts 16. Yeah. In Macedonia. Calling in. The same, the call to go over mm -hmm. to Macedonia. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good point. The other thing that's of interest in here is that there's a little genealogy, of course, uh, that we come through for a listing of all of the sons uh, of the tribes that are going down into Egypt. And, um, it's a little bit curious because at one point um, he says that they're 66 and at another point he says that they're 70 and it winds up being a phone who you count who you don't count. Okay, so um, I think I'm listening. This is what the text says and this is from ESV. Uh, the sons of Leah and including Dinah, and it says daughters, it didn't say how many other daughters there might have been, but that was a total of 33 uh, the sons of Zilpah were 16, the sons of Rachel were 14, and the sons of Billah were 7. Um, and that totals uh, 66 descendants, if you just total that. Now, uh, later it says 70, and the difference is um, this count, the count of 66, um, does not include the two sons that died, uh, Ur and Onan, that we talked about last week. Nor does it include Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, but when you look at the count of 70, uh, where's my note on that? <laughs> 70, it includes Joseph and Ephraim, but I think it does not include Dinah. So there's, there is a way to reconcile those two things. It's basically a lot of people <laughs> that went down, but uh, that's the reason you have one number one place and the other number another place. Um, and then Joseph and Jacob were reunited in verse 29. I'll just read this little part 28. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. In 29, then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, and know that you are still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh, and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who are in the land of Canaan, have come to me, and the men are shepherds, and they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds, and all that they have. Um, when Pharaoh, this is interesting. When Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock, not shepherds, <laughs> keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, uh, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So interesting, though, later on, when they go, they slip up and they say, oh, we're shepherds. <laughs> and it doesn't seem to bother Pharaoh. I mean, he lets them go to Goshen anyway. So maybe they were just kind of over-concerned about that. I don't know. But um, it's kind of interesting. I really thought there was that taboo about being a shepherd in Egypt. And uh, certainly for Pharaoh, it didn't seem to matter. Maybe for other people, it would have. Okay, is there anything else going to And let's see, what is this one? This is the history of Joseph and his brethren. This is. Joseph and his brothers, welcomed by Pharaoh. Maybe that's what it looked like. Yeah. And 47. Jacob's, oh, there we go. We got five minutes for 47. Perfect timing. Uh, Jacob's family settles in Goshen. So they take five of the brothers to go before Pharaoh. That is in verse 2 of chapter 47. And from among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. This is where this is where they actually ask him, what's your occupation? Oh, we're shepherds. <laughs> After he just told them, don't tell them you're shepherds. <laughs> but he did it anyway. <laughs> uh, and then Pharaoh says, go settle in the best of the land, which was Goshen. Goshen. And um, Jacob actually blesses Pharaoh. I thought this is really interesting. Verse 7, Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood before Pharaoh 
And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, it's the leader of Egypt, and poor little old Jacob here is blessing him. Uh, and Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years, the days of the years of my sojourn are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourn. Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went up from the presence of Pharaoh. So that's kind of interesting that you got a, basically a nobody blessing the leader of Egypt. It's a pretty important person. Um, and so here, uh, Jacob is 130 years old. We find that out in verse 9. And of course, as I said earlier, he winds up dying at 147. So they live in the land of Goshen for 147 years. So his total lifespan is of course of 17 more years uh, after this, which you know, he's ready to die right here. He said, I've seen him, I, I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> I've seen Joseph, I know he's alive, just let me go on. But he lived 17 more years, which is pretty remarkable. And then the last thing I put on here, let me get another picture. Let's see if that is either. Joseph presents his father to Pharaoh. Um, what the fuck are we doing? Did I go backwards? Yeah. No, you didn't. I thought we had this side. No, you didn't. Okay, so Joseph gathered up all the money. And, oh, this is where he. Um, let me just summarize this real quickly. So Joseph gets real shrewd about the famine in the land and people needing grain and, and money. So he, he first goes to the people of Egypt and says, you know, sell out your livestock and I'll give you grain. So they do that. And then they eat the grain and they're out of grain. So then they go back and he says, okay, well, you're out of livestock. So now give me your land. So they do that. <laughs> and give him his land and give him some grain. And then the third time uh, he comes back and uh, gives them seed uh, but they have to give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. And that kind of becomes an ongoing thing. It's like a tax, if you will, the fifth of the boy. And this is how Pharaoh gets really, really rich. And Joseph is doing it. So uh, he's pretty shrewd uh, in doing that. And this is where he dies at 147. And so this is that slide I was talking about. It shows you where Goshen is, upper right hand corner of uh, Egypt, very fertile because it's real close to the Nile there that overflows. Uh, I don't know what that is. Joseph overseeing Pharaoh's granaries. Now, this is the last thing we'll talk about. This is a timeline that I found in one of the commentaries. I'm not 100% sure I agree with this, but it's one person's idea of kind of when all this stuff happened. I think I said earlier in the class that we're talking about the uh, second half of the second millennium BC, so around 15, 1600 to uh, 1000, or, or really from 2000 to about 15, 1600. And so this has Abraham leaving Haran around 1700 BC, and then shortly after that, in the early part of the 17th century, before kings coming from the east and going to war and all of that, um, it has Jacob going to Mesopotamia to get uh, Leah and Rachel as his wives around 1640 BC and then Joseph being sold into slavery around 1600 and then these, the family being reunited and settling in Egypt around 1580 BC. So, you know, we don't really know much about these dates in terms of precision. That's just one person's best guess. I think it's a little dubious to me because 1580 is where they went and settled in <coughs> Egypt. It was a while before um, another pharaoh came in power who didn't know Joseph and made them slaves, right? So it wasn't like, like that. It was several years. And they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. So if you take 400 off of this, even if you are generous and say it starts at 1580, that would leave you 1120. David was king of Israel in 1000 BC. And that's a pretty solid thing. So that didn't leave a whole lot of time for them to have the exodus, wander in the wilderness for 40 years, <laughs> conquer the land, have a bunch of judges, and then have that. It's only about 140 years maybe <laughs> for all that to happen, which makes me a little bit skeptical that this is actually right. But 
And I think, I'll have to look this up for you for next week. I think historically there are two proposed dates for the Exodus. For people, who, some people don't believe there was an Exodus, but for people who do, um, there's an early date and a late date uh, for the Exodus. So we're not even sure about when that happened itself. But, uh, but this does kind of give us some perspective. We are working in kind of the, the second millennium BC in the top half of it probably for all of these events that we've been going from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and so forth. So next week we will wrap up with 48 through 50. And any other questions about what we were just talking about? One, one thing sure. uh, that you mentioned earlier about God's providence in this. Mm -hmm. And we see it sometimes. Right. Um, or no. That thought on this one with uh, Israel. If God had left them in Canaan, they would have probably intermarried with Canaanites and, and, and almost disappeared as a people. So one commentator commented that he needed to get them out of Canaan and into Egypt, even though they're in slavery for 400 years. It's hard to see God's providence, but yeah. God was behind all of this. And, and you think about that. The Passover is so central. Yeah. And there would have been a Passover yeah. if they hadn't been in Egypt, right? I mean, that was the whole thing of them getting out of Egypt. And, and today, still, Passover is oh, huge yeah. for Jews. And, and it's the Passover, we have a Christian <laughs> Passover too, because Jesus is being the Passover. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, it is so central to the whole story. Yeah. And during that 400 years, they probably didn't think this is great. You know? <laughs> We're making straw, making bricks out of straw, and it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> but that's a good point. Anything else? I think we're right on time. So we will see you next week and wrap this thing up. <laughs>